Welcome to the Beyond the Reef podcast, where I talk to experts and researchers in the reef aquarium hobby, discussing a broad range of topics from corals and reef biology to water chemistry and equipment. We take a deep dive into our guests' methods, techniques, and top reef keeping tips. My name is Adam Sutherland, and I am the owner operator of Frag Garage Corals, based out of British Columbia, Canada. Hey guys, welcome to another episode. Today I am joined by a returning guest, Alan Vo of CRT Reefs. And if you've been following Alan since the last time I had him on, he has been working really hard on this feeding concoction. And the feeding concoction seems to be getting a fair bit of attention right now. So uh, as I tend to talk to Alan on a regular basis, uh, I thought I would give him a chance to sort of explain some of his reasoning and methods behind it. And I just want to say, I, I don't think that this method is for everyone and, and it should definitely be taken very carefully. There isn't an exact recipe, but I think what's more important about this conversation is the things that we're talking about in terms of coral nutrition and delivery of nutrients to the coral. Uh, we also talked about uh, your reefing intuition, having kind of a sixth sense about things going on in your system. We also talked about troubleshooting problems with corals. And I'm going to ask, as per usual, that you hit that subscribe button, like, share, comment, reach out, leave us a review. And if you want to support us directly, we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash beyond the reef podcast. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Alan Vo of CRT Reefs. Uh, cool, man. Well, um, I want to have you back because, I mean, we chat pretty often, but uh, the, the episode we did was was a pretty popular one. Um, and uh, I feel like we can elaborate on, you know, some of the things we've been discussing in, in your concoction and, and a few other things, just kind of a catch up. So... Um, where do we start? Should we maybe just give me a little breakdown for people that don't know or kind of know a little bit about your feeding concoction and, and you know, infusing foods with bacteria and kind of how, how you came to it and, and a gist of what it is? All right. I mean, it's a pretty much like a shotgun approach at feeding your fish tank, right? Looking at the entire kitchen sink and trying to create an edible meal out of it, right? And so the inception of this was uh, I had just accumulated a bunch of products over the years and I wanted to, you know, use these products in a way where I didn't just throw them out at the end of the day and waste a bunch of money because you get samples of things or you get curious and you just end up using it once or twice and then tossing it away or losing it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because sometimes uh, there are certain products you don't really know if they did anything or much of yeah, anything exactly. at all. Yeah, so you're just right. kind of like, meh, meh, it didn't really see any difference, so maybe just put it in the shelf for now. Mm-hmm. Especially with, like, uh, when you go to, like, frag swaps or some of the big coral shows, you'll get, like, a bunch of samples of, like, coral food mm-hmm. or, like, new products coming out. And, like, you know, like like you said, you'll try it once or twice. You're like, eh, you know, or, like, you'll spot feed once or twice and you, you get busy or whatever. Yeah. And like, that just kind of sits there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I just accumulate stuff over the years and I try to sit down and kind of formulate like a game plan or like a hypothetical approach where I could use everything in, you know, a kind of bioremediating way. And uh, I kind of settled on this uh, using the bacteria products that are commonly available in like the aquarium hobby, um, stuff that you can probably buy off the shelf and you know, just kind of formulating and experimenting on my own tanks. And then, you know, over time, you know, it's been through a bunch of different iterations and Mm -hmm. I've kind of found like the core components of what I need, especially for my system. And from there, I started, um, you know, getting people that were willing to take on the risk and experimenting on their own tanks. And Mm -hmm. luckily I didn't uh, end up screwing anyone and causing a, angry phone call with me so yeah. i'm i'm lucky on that end but yeah. you know the, all those people have reported back to me and said they've been super excited and happy from the results that they've gotten and you know the great thing is that you know they're not even following the exact recipe that i mm-hmm. use it's a similar recipe that nails the core components right mm-hmm. so it seems uh, reproducible given different initial ingredients so i mean it's similar to how I said earlier, kind of like creating this meal, right? You could have luxury ingredients, but at the end of the day, you're still going to make a chocolate chip cookie. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. So if you break it down, what are the, I guess there's essentially four or five major components to it, right? You could probably break it down to. Yeah. So um, you're obviously going to need your bacteria source. And this is where this uh, source of life is coming from, right? This is how the concoction is held up, basically. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to need a particulate food, uh, like anything that you feed your fish tank, like especially your coral, like reef roids, uh, stuff like that. Any ground up um, foods like pellets, flakes, that will work too. Mm-hmm. Um and then you'll need a carbon source for the direct uh, benefit of the bacteria, right? The bacteria need a uh, pretty much readily available food source for them because mm-hmm. most of these products uh, have dormant bacteria, right? And you're going to need uh, – there's going to be several hours of lag time before these dormant bacteria kind of wake up yeah. and start multiplying. Uh, so one thing I would it, just – just as a side question, and we'll probably get more into this, but as a carbon source, wouldn't the particulate food – wouldn't part of that be the carbon source as well? Exactly. I yeah. mean, everything – all organic matter, right, has yeah. the carbon in it. And, yeah. you know, thus it is a carbon source, but it is like um, the sense of like bioavailability, like the immediate use case mm-hmm. of these yeah. uh, these molecules, right? Yeah. Having like free form like amino acids versus a large protein is much different, right? And mm-hmm. the bacteria can use these smaller compounds much easier than these larger yeah. uh, molecules. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that's that's the concept of like using like a simple, you know, kind of like a simple sugar, where a lot of the research has kind of pointed out, um, in you know large scale aquaculture, they do something similar and they use molasses, right? Mm. And it's a pretty complex mm-hmm. carbohydrate, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's re- very cheap, so yeah. that's why they use it. Definitely, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so we got the bacteria, the particulate, the carbon source. And then uh, you're going to need like a form of like trace element supplementation, right? So in this case, um, I'm using fresh salt water, right? Fresh mm-hmm. salt water, like fresh salt water mix, um, and... From that salt mix, you should have all the required trace that you will eventually dose into your tank. And plus, the the salt also has the added benefit of kind of nullifying uh, some weird microbial growth as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so fresh salt versus using tank tank yeah. water, which is tempting because, you know, if you don't have fresh salt water made up, you're going to want to maybe use the water from your tank. But, um, yeah, you, you explained in your video, which I will link to. Uh, that some of the reasons for using fresh tank water versus water in your tank. And uh, yeah, maybe just elaborate on that for a second, because I think that's a really important note, because I didn't I didn't catch that the first time around either. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think I personally could have done a better job in my video kind of talking about the necessity for, um, you know, strict biosecurity, right? wearing the proper, you know, uh, face mask, gloves, um, proper utensils individualized for each ingredient. So that way you can kind of minimize Mm cross-contamination. And I think I forgot to mention that in the preparation process, I'll go through the creation of, um, you know, kind of creating this mix is that I will put, I'll mix all the dry ingredients together uh, minus the uh, bacteria or live products right so all the feed products um whatever powder uh whatever and i'll mix that together and then i'll boil rodi water right and then that will sterilize the rodi Mm -hmm. water Mm -hmm. i'll add the proper amount of salt for the volume that i'm going to mix right so i'll do the math and calculate that Mm -hmm. and get it to the right salinity and then from there i'll add the RODI water, once it's cooled down to around uh, 130, 100 degrees, mm-hmm. around that realm is when um, a lot of these bacteria are kind of optimized at you know, multiplying. Mm-hmm. And then at that point, I'll add in the bacteria. Um, oh, I'll add in the enzymes first, and then I'll add in the bacteria afterwards. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I you know, give it a, a good mixing. Then I'll either choose to... I'll either choose to let it sit if I plan on using it immediately. So I'll let it, you know, kind of sit. I'll shake it every few hours and use it within a few days. Or if sometimes I have kind of gone to the extreme lengths of culturing it for 
roughly like weeks, uh, a week at a time. But that's relatively like resource intensive and it's not like extremely feasible long run if you're really worried about potential like contamination. Yeah, it's because a lot. how do you really know if it's starting to go off? Like you, you have some things that you know what to look for in the concoction. You're, you've you've right. got the, I mean, you basically created the, the concept or put this concept together. So you kind of know what to look for, but I would imagine smell would be a part of it. Yeah, the smell is a very, like, you know, upfront indicator. You know, the human body is kind of made to recognize, you know, Mm -hmm. these harmful things. Yeah. So once you kind of notice anything kind of rancid, that's a very big sign to restart, toss it out, re-sterilize. And, you know, for the most part, given that you provide a, you know, theoretically, given that you provide the proper inoculation dose, you know, these probiotic bacteria should outcompete any foreign pathogens that kind of settle in, mm-hmm. given that the culture has had enough time where, it, you know, it is the dominant strain in the in the culture medium, right? So after a good amount of time, the probiotics have established themselves through, like, the you know, the concept of, like, uh, competitive exclusion. These bacteria will either outcompete the pathogens in terms of resource or um, certain bacteria produce um, antiseptic properties that kind of kill off uh, invading pathogens as well. And um, most of these, uh, you know, strains such as like Vibrio and stuff are killed off by the probiotics. Yeah. But an- another thing to note, yeah, is um, this is very strain specific in bacteria, right? So you could have the same species of bacteria but not like the exact same strain and the efficacies of each strain is very, uh, very as well. So, mm. you know, there's, there's also that to think about. And then there's things like such as growing, uh, these bacteria strains in like monocultures and, um, like polycultures that kind of like mixed strains. So there's a bunch of like different, like, uh, compounding factors as well or mm. confounding factors. Well, I was going to ask, um, you know, one factor I would think about the carbon source is, and we you, were, you sort of touched on this a little bit, but my conversations with, um, I talked to Lou from Tropic Marine and Claude from Fauna Marine, and they both kind of broke down that it, we need these long chain carbon sources to get better probability of feeding the good strains of bacteria that we want. Um, right. But then I wonder, like you're saying, you were talking about simple sugars being what you're wanting to add to this concoction, which I don't think a simple sugar is going to be a long chain uh, carbon source. Right. In in the concoction, I guess there is a mixture of both, right, through the organic particulate foods that we put in mm-hmm. and like the supplementations of like other things like acetic acid. You know, you're kind of having the uh, I guess in this kind of kitchen sink approach or grandma style approach, like a shotgun, feed everything in the room, mm-hmm. you know. But given that every we know everything in the room, given that we start with a sterile product and we know, you know, these are probiotic bacteria to begin with, and that people have had success using them, mm-hmm. you know, everyone is the in the room is your friend, right? So you might as well feed them. Mm-hmm. So that's how you know my my train of thought went. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so given that, that, that you sense. can, yeah, given that you can wipe all you know potential contamination or pathogens, and then inoculate with a given or proven or maybe anecdotally proven good strain of bacteria, mm-hmm. you know, it shouldn't be any issue. You know, even though that there might not be a, the exact science on it, you know, maybe science just hasn't looked this direction yet, um, but. If thousands of people say that it works or, you know, there are a a lot of factors kind of correlated to the use of this product, there's got to be something in it. You know what I mean? Especially with, you know, products from KZ, Mm -hmm. Um, even though they are just whatever, who knows, right? Yeah, we don't know. what They they don't list the strains of bacteria that are in. But uh, so what, what, I mean, you've experimented with a few different um, brands of bacteria. You're not really partial to any in particular um but well maybe you are but is there anything that you would you would sort of suggest is kind of your your best go-to or do you tend to say you got to mix a couple different brands well you know this kind of goes back to the issue of us not knowing what Mm -hmm. is in each bottle right 
Like I have some hints, right, of what the composition is of certain products, but I don't know the entire picture of things, right? And like I said earlier, um, you can have different effects by culturing, you know, certain bacteria individually or with other uh, strains as well. Mm-hmm. So it could be like, you know, as complex as I guess like a common analogy for us would be like yogurt versus kefir. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yogurt is kind of usually just one or two strains of bacteria relatively flat. Mm-hmm. And kefir is just like super kind of like carbonated fizzy drink that has like this crazy taste and it's a polyculture of bacteria mm-hmm. you know what mm-hmm. I mean? but it starts from the same raw ingredient which is milk mm-hmm. you see how interesting yeah i didn't know that you know yeah yeah so you can see how you know just the addition of like let's say like a different strain of bacteria could have you know radical changes on you know the source right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the texture is different the taste is different the smell is different and obviously if we apply this in the sense or for our corals, you know, perhaps there's like a, some analogous thing there. Yeah. But I mean, I guess there are some bacteria on the market that we do know what is in them. There's, you know, there's the um, purple sulfur bacteria type product. Yeah. Um, the PNS stuff. Yeah. yeah. The PNS Personally, stuff. Yeah. I, I haven't, um, I don't have personal experience with it, mm-hmm. so I can't say anything about it, but certain people say it's good. Some people, according to the reviews I read, have had issues, but I can't say if those issues were directly caused from them dosing it. You know, it could have been some under other underlying thing. Yeah. But, you know, according to the research out there, you know, it says it's beneficial. So I would be inclined to assume that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, there's a Tropic Marine. um, It's the nitrobiotic. I'm pretty sure that bottle tells you what is in there. And, you know, one of those strains you see sometimes in these um, bacteria bottles is lactobacillus like which is the yogurt uh bacteria which is interesting because as far as i understand it's not i don't think it's found in the ocean i don't think lactobacillus is actually like an active bacteria in the ocean but i I could be wrong on this maybe we fact check this (laughs) you you know the interesting thing about um or lactic acid bacteria is that you know they have a lot of other I guess, general purposes as well. They have um, a very great ability to enhance the bioavailability of feeds, right? A lot of lactic acid bacteria are are used in uh, commercial like feed Mm -hmm. for agriculture and aquaculture as well. And also, you know, like human foods like yogurt. Yeah. So they have this ability to change the nutritional profile of the food and I think some of these um, some of these bacteria products, like you probably do have some lactobacillus strain in there. Mm. So I think you know the addition of it is probably beneficial. But like you said, it might not exist in the ocean. But the thing is, you know, these terrestrial microbes could still play a beneficial role. Mm-hmm. Just like how you know a lot of people aren't you know from the coastline yet still enjoy aquatic or marine things yeah yeah for sure yeah and i think maybe the lactobacillus could be a bacteria that's a little bit better suited for this concoction because you're kind of doing you're almost kind of pre-digesting some of the foods in a way you know yeah so actually yeah um good that you mentioned like pre-digestion because uh this is pretty much uh diet or pre-digestion yeah. right here yeah this is um you know this is the newest iteration of the concoction so i've made it essentially super duper concentrated and i think much more stable in this form mm-hmm. and uh what i started in here was a bunch of raw like whole matter you know a bunch of seafood and stuff and at this point you can kind of see it's like a, a fine like paste kind of mm-hmm. like a goop yeah. So did it thicken quite a bit? Uh, so, yeah. Uh, if anyone's like kind of familiar with like the, the process of like fermentation, you'll know like um, the ferment will go through several stages as well. So um, the proteins and the lipids will separate and you'll see like a, a layer start to form. 
and there's different kind of like densities throughout this. So it'll be mm-hmm. kind of thick in some areas and a bit more liquidy in some other areas. And, um, you know, I, from what I'm reading or from the research that I've done and the potential applications of this product, I'm pretty sure it's relatively stable or it should be kind of treated like a fine wine. You know, it mm-hmm. should be taken to a specific age, a specific age to mature. And once there's like, you know, this like fine, like tipping point used, but it can also be used throughout its like maturation as well. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, um, you know, depends if you want like the 20 year vintage or, you know, year two. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too. I mean, obviously, you're not like a microbiologist or anything, but it would be interesting to get the take of someone in that field to kind of take a look at this at its various stages of development and kind of see what's really happening. Yeah, I mean, it it would be great if I was, you know, trained in that field. (laughs) Uh, Why not? Just get at it. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm doing as much, uh, you know, backyard scientist work as I can here. But I mean, luckily, um, a good friend of mine, uh, he's he actually is a microbiologist. Nice. Uh, We went to school together. And, uh, you know, anytime I have issues reading like the really dense literature or have like, you know, some random ideas, I consult him and he kind of walks me through the process and cool. best practices. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not without that resource, which I'm really glad to have, you know, mm-hmm. otherwise, like I, it's pretty much a shot in the dark either way. And I mean, throughout this thing, it's pretty much been a, a shot in the dark and kind of find a, a glimpse of light here and there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I mean, I guess it's, um, it's important for people to understand that, you know, you're a hobbyist, but you, I, I mean, I know you enough to know that you're a person that knows how to study and read the literature. So you may not have the, um, you know, the degrees to back some of this research, but you have the experience and you put the work in. So, um, you know, I think, uh, and plus a lot of people have said it's worked well for them. So can't, can't yeah. argue with that. <laughs> I mean, ha- how was it for you? I think you said you tried it, right? Yeah, so I think there's something that I did wrong from the beginning was, um, well, I was using tank water. I wasn't making fresh salt water. Um, so, you know, the, you know, like you're saying, there's a chance that if you're using tank water, there could be some strains of bacteria that end up getting essentially magnified in the concoction, and then you're adding more of this bad bacteria basically back to your tank or just a mix of bacteria that you may not want. Um, So that was something I did differently. And then I wasn't oxygenating the mixture. So I would just shake it every, every time I went past the room or whatever, but um, I didn't have like a constant oxygen um, supply going. So I'd had some questions about that, but um, can you explain why you want to have a constant, you know, an, a bubbler or an air stone or whatever for it? Yeah. So, I mean, what you basically said was kind of V1 or like the first iteration of what I did. Mm-hmm. Um, and pretty much in theory that should work. Right. Um, but you know, I think given the short amount of time that it takes, given the conditions of um, like kind of that uh, what, stagnant, like non constantly aerated mixture, mm-hmm. the po- the population of bacteria just grows slower. Right. Mm-hmm. Usually, when I was doing it that way, it would take about two or three days before I noticed a substantial biofilm, especially mm-hmm. once I would um, you know let it kind of sit and marinate for a while you could definitely see like layers of bacteria forming especially over like the foods and any of the sediment there's Mm -hmm. like a thick slime so i started realizing that over time as these bacteria colonies grow they're going to suffocate each other right and if you don't keep them you know constantly like maximized to the entire volume of the container by splitting up the colonies and then having them kind of float around you know this is going to lead to potentially a crash of the culture that you're growing. So the way that you first did it, I would say is completely viable, except, you know, maybe start with um, sterilized salt water and then grow, you know, your selected bacteria. But the constant 
aeration model is something that if you're thinking of like a long-term multi-day culture, right? If you can, especially if you can keep it uh, sterile and if you can ensure like a clean initial product, mm-hmm. you could potentially, you know, culture these bacteria strains that you're paying, you know, just a bunch of continual money for just to replace and re-up, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. you're getting, you're, you're getting the starter ingredients, right? So it's like buying like a, a plant at the store, you know what I mean? If if mm-hmm. it grows, you can get another plant eventually. Mm-hmm. But if it doesn't, you use it up and it just kind of wilts away. Well, you're going to have to buy another one or if not, whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so the aeration, I kind of understand that it's sort of if there are these bacteria strains are multiplying, um, then the oxygen and carbon dioxide, like the gas composition is changing. So you're essentially, you're wanting to just exchange the air, right? Because yeah. I'm, I, I'm yeah. going to assume some of these bacteria strains are anaerobic and some of them are aerobic bacteria. They're probably mm-hmm. some of both types, would you say? Mm-hmm. Or? Yeah, probably. Most likely these like bacteria, like, uh, it's like sludge reducers have like mm-hmm. a, a mix of anaerobic and aerobic uh, microorganisms. Mm-hmm. So, you know, depending on what method you choose to, you know, do the concoction, you're you're going to favor one strain or one strain or the other. Right? Mm-hmm. But you know, if you can find like a happy medium, obviously that's where we want to shoot for, like this weird, like this hypothetical equilibrium point. Mm-hmm. Um, but with the constant aeration, given you know, if we don't constantly aerate it and if you don't shake it up ever, you're gonna you you are going to create a rapid oxygen depletion scenario. Mm-hmm. And that could alter the pH in the solution. And that could switch up the um, microbial composition as well. And you also don't really want to be adding a super low pH effluent into your tank, right? That's gonna screw up your tank and then that could potentially lead to a bacterial bloom and then uh, oxygen depletion as well yeah so you obviously want to you know sit back and you know work out the ratios and how much your tank needs work out the amount of biomass in your system and how much your your system is capable to process at Mm -hmm. its current state right and like i also want to mention is that i developed this methodology to fix my specific situation right so Mm -hmm. if you don't specifically like fall into what I need or the category of reefer that I am, um, it might not be the right method for you, you know, because I'm catering to a, a density, a, a extremely high coral density. Yeah. Whereas let's say like a year one reefer with a few corals, much less dense system, you could do what I do, but in a sense, you could be just throwing your system too crazy out of whack. Yeah. Even though that, you know, everything prescribed has a potential you know, benefit and upside, there's still a chance that you're just doing too much upside, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And that huge boom is ultimately going to lead to a bust eventually. You you just can't sustain it. Yeah, like you're saying too, like a more sparsely populated tank is also less competitive for the food that is available versus, you know, a heavily stocked system like you or I have. There's so many mouths to feed that this big broadcast feeding kind of technique is... Is I, I mean, there's just a much bigger buffer for all of that to be absorbed and processed. Oh, yeah. And especially, you know, kind of like systems like ours where we have a bunch of like, individual, like unique colonies growing super close together. All these corals need roughly the same uh, requirements, right? But each individual is going to need a certain, you know, excess of a specific thing versus the other, you know, neighbor. And if we kind of treat our systems kind of like historically and just spot feed as need or whatever, we we kind of overlook like the runt corals in our tank, mm-hmm. you know, like the genetically like this position corals like that aren't as like competitive. Like let's say like the acros with less polyp per square inch, or you know, mm-hmm. certain corals like that obviously can't eat as much. Let's say like a uh, oloripes versus the millipora, right? Yeah. You can tell. You can tell which coral eats more by the density of polyps. Definitely, right? yeah. And so if we just kind of approach this like old school, just chuck it into the tank, maybe the coral eats it, maybe it doesn't, you you can potentially end up with a, like a following situation, right? So if your tank doesn't eat all the food that you chuck in there, 
your water's going to get dirty. You're going to get like algae issues or make your grow some weird thing. Or, um, you know, it just killed the coral, you know, by overfeeding it. Yeah. There's a, yeah. there's a chance that by putting in too much food that the coral can't digest it because it's not uh, like used to it. You know, if yeah. you were getting fed once a day and then you're getting fed every hour, you're going to inflate up and you're not going to be able to digest it all at yeah. once. Yeah, that's not good. Um, something I adapted to my method when I feed, you know, my version of the concoction is I actually lift my filter socks in my sump out temporarily so that they don't catch the food because the next chamber in my sump has live rock in it. And my thinking is that that live rock is full of little like pods and little small organisms. And they're going to be able to use whatever's left of that. Whereas if it just goes in my filter socks, it's just going to kind of sit in there and decay and potentially dirty up the system. So that's just a little mm -hmm. thing I, I kind of thought of. You know, uh, funny you talk about filter socks. I don't change mine. They're yeah. just in there. Yeah. Um, but I use like the mesh ones and every time I look in there, there's not really any build up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which that's is not kind bad. of Interesting so, little side note, actually. Um, I, one of my systems, the filter socks just, uh, they're the mesh ones as well and they don't seem to fill up. I don't have to replace them. I don't know where the detritus is going, but they, I guess, you know, I, I still, I still, you know, clean them every once in a while, but they don't. They don't get blocked up like the ones do in my other system. Anyways, yeah. um, I noticed that those banded trochus snails have been breeding like crazy since I stopped oh, yeah. changing the filter socks all the time. And I think oh, there's that's something. Where I, find all mine. I think that's that mesh material is is kind of an ideal environment for the settlement of the the eggs and sperm. I think that's like actually a surface where you know unless that's just where you happen to find them because they get caught in there but i i kind of think that that's where they're called they're culturing yeah i mean like it's like um you know i think that texture is like adequate for like whatever films or algae that mm -hmm. those baby snails eat and they just kind of grow up inside the the mesh sock and then every few months i'll look in my my filter sock compartment and i'll be like oh i got like five or ten baby snails yeah, yeah i'll yeah. chuck them in my tank and, uh, you know, it's pretty convenient. The only kind of sucky part is uh, they end up in your skimmer pump. Mm -hmm. And uh, you break a tooth or two, and then you're like, uh, yeah, kind yeah. of pain in the butt. It's hard to avoid them when they're small like that. But, uh, yeah, but it's nice. Yeah, I just moved about 100 out of my sump into my other tanks. So, um, you oh, know, sweet. all little quarter inch, like kind of, um, I'd say an eighth inch to a quarter inch in size. So, um, oh, they're great. Yeah, totally. Awesome. And actually, another thing I'll add to that is uh, I used to run UV on that system and I and I just turned the UV off. So I had them breeding about two years ago. Uh, and that was pre UV. And then and I was probably changing the filter socks more. And the things I've changed is no UV, keep the filter socks on. And now I'm culturing, you know, snails constantly now by accident. So I don't know. <laughs> not not the, to take away from changing your filter socks, but um, I think the UV was probably sterilizing um, the spawns, and then um, they just didn't have a proper surface for settlement or whatever. Yeah, is your UV plumbed through your return? Yeah, yeah, directly. Through okay, the so okay, so everything pumped up and the display has to go through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense because um, I used to I, I used to run a UV as well, but it's, it wasn't plumbed through the the main return line mm -hmm. and uh i would still get some you know larvae settlement so mm -hmm. i would still collect some snails every few years but i think running you know like you uh just kills everything that passes through yeah yeah definitely gives better probability uh okay let's get back to the concoction because i don't think we talked about the kind of last component which is the kind of zeozyme supercharging side of it yeah are you so, still doing that you know I think since our last talk, you know, it's been pretty hard for me to get my hands on Zeozyme. It seems like I, I caused like a shortage or something. <laughs> yeah, you should be getting but, a commission for sure. <laughs> that'd be sweet. But um, no, yeah, the Zeozyme I think is pretty crucial for the beginning first steps, right? Mm -hmm. So what the enzyme does is it's a catalyst, right? So when catalysts do is that they lower the activation energy for reactions to occur, right? So certain things, certain reactions will kind of occur spontaneously, right? Mm -hmm. 
And by having enough ambient energy in the system, and by lowering this barrier, we kind of limit, uh, we lower the threshold at which these reactions can take place. And these reactions that we want are like the breakdown of the biological components into more bioactive compounds, right? So these large proteins getting split down into amino acids mm. or these complex sugars being turned into simple carbohydrates, right? Mm. So all these like complex foods that we put in, like the coral foods, right, are pretty much first getting digested by the enzymes, right? lowering the activation energy and just kind of releasing all that stuff into the water. And then secondly, through the bacteria that will eventually kind of waken up from their dormant state and then also secrete their own enzymes and then release more nutrients into the water. And this is where, you know, the two benefits could come into play where it could be the release of these nutrients into the water, which is causing the great benefit in the coral, mm -hmm. or let's say it could be the large influx of bacteria growth that could be benefiting the coral, or you know both factors kind of working together. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, I don't know, and there's not much literature on this topic as well. Mm -hmm. It's relatively novel, so we're just kind of going as uh, you know. Uh, we go here yeah for sure the yeah the zeovid i mean yeah essentially like it's a stim it says that it stimulates or amplifies the effect of, of zeobac so the effects of the bacteria so it's kind of in a way like a metabolic boost right right so in kind of like parsing through that language we can kind of settle on you know some guesses of what it could be right mm -hmm. in terms of enhancing biology in this sense it could be like we said earlier it could be a specific enzyme that makes things more available thus more biology occurs or it could be an additive such as maybe let's say um some carbohydrate as well because mm -hmm. you know the zeozyme powder it's got like an interesting texture you know it's mm -hmm. not I wouldn't say it's dry. It's like it seems to be like somewhat hydrated, but it looks like this minerally powder. Mm -hmm. And there's specific you, you can see like once you put it into the water, um, certain bubbles will rise from it, and you'll see like the uh, the food particles kind of like dissolve and turn into mush over time. So there's obviously some other enzymes in there as well. Yeah. And you know enzymes are enzymes, so. I'm sure you could um, find some at like the health supplement store and, you know, kind of supplement that in there in place of Zeozyme. But it's just this, what is this like white powder that it makes up the bulk of it? You know yeah, I mean? that's the tricky part because it's probably something fairly cheap and, and fairly accessible, but we just don't, you know, have, we don't know yeah. what it is. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think anecdotally it, it might be dolomite. Um, hmm. I think I was talking to Michael Paletta, and I, I had the idea, and I think he said the magnesium uh, of the zeozyme was extremely high mm -hmm. compared to like a, a test sample. So it could potentially be like a, a form of dolomite, like a very pure form, because mm -hmm. that's also just another concept like uh, lime or calcium carbonate. It's mm -hmm. just like another form, essentially. Yeah. And it's a yeah. relatively inert mineral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wondered, because you were talking about, um, this was in your video, um, you are talking about finding some different sources for the zeozyme. And I was wondering about the fauna marine coral balance. And I can probably ask Claude about this. Um, but it seems to, from what I read about it, potentially be something somewhat similar as well, but it's kind of a marine polymer kind of based, um, substance. Um, I'll put it in the show notes here too. Okay. Uh, yeah. personally, I, I haven't used that product, but, um, I think I have read the description a few times. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, hasn't crossed my, my shopping cart yet, mm -hmm. but you know, it does relatively say the same things. It and does kind of, yeah. It, it looks kind of, it's like this white powder. Exactly, That yeah. says it's going to do the same thing. And I think Claude said in one of his uh, other interviews that, you know, those those 
products typically have like a super fine zeolite and some other ingredient mixed in as well. Mm-hmm. So it, it's essentially the same as, you know, coral snow, right? You're adding lime or like some flocculent mm-hmm. to kind of catch all the organics and yellowing agents in the water. Yeah. And yeah. then plus some other thing to digest other, maybe other organic compounds yeah. that are left behind. So essentially, you know, you could probably make it yourself as long as you have the, the right quality ingredients, but mm-hmm. it's just coming down to knowing what the right ingredients are in the first place. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and hey, if anybody from Coraline Zook ever wants to talk to me, that would be cool. i see if they leak any secrets, but I, I don't think so. I've emailed them before, and they never have responded to me, like, even just with a basic question, so I don't know. Hey, there's always the, the Zeovid forum. Yeah. I don't know if people still use that, but uh, there's always there. That's a pretty great resource for, you know, it was for me at least back in the day mm-hmm. when I was running like a, like a straight up just ultra low nutrient system and running the Zeovit uh, straight from the book mm-hmm. where now it's kind of like a super modified reverse theory Zeovit system that I'm running. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, another thought. This is a little sidetrack thing here, but I know that Fauna Marin has the uh, the Vibex is a, like a Vibrio um, competing bacteria strain coming out. I wonder if adding that to the concoction could potentially magnify its effects as well. Or if, say, if you had any contam- contaminants that had Vibrio in your concoction, it may potentially, you know, outrule them. Yeah. So you know, from the stuff that I've been reading. A lot of these like anti vibrio bacteria strains are used in commercial like fish and shrimp aquaculture, right? Mm-hmm. Just due to um, the densities of which these feed animals are grown at. Obviously, there's going to be like illness that's easily spreading around those like closed environments. And vibrio is a large issue in that sector. Mm-hmm. So previously, um, you know, the use of antibiotics was pretty prevalent. And since then, antibiotic resistance has, you know, become also very prevalent. Mm-hmm. And agriculture and aquaculture has kind of shifted towards a probiotic slash prebiotic slash symbiotic, um, you know, solution, where they start utilizing uh, bacteria and optimal like uh, bacteria growth mediums to kind of remediate these pathogens. And a lot of these bacteria are certain strains of bacillus which produce certain antiseptic compounds that either ward off the vibrio and they kind of create this um area of inhibition Mm -hmm. that prevent the vibrio from growing or directly just outcompete it in the system Mm -hmm. and i think you know a lot of these products have application directly in the reef hobby as well but it also depends on the use case right and when you say um, could this potentially enhance the concoction? It could, and it also could harm it as well because mm-hmm. adding a another bacteria strain, like I said, with the example of like yogurt and kefir, you know, adding one more could completely change the composition of your final product, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why people settle on certain things because these guys get along and then if you had one guy that you don't know is kind of iffy with the others Mm -hmm. um it could result in something nasty that you don't want yeah i mean if the vibex is like a highly competitive strain you know then it may potentially kind of make some of your other good strains that you're trying to add um kind of uh reduce them to almost nothing yeah but the thing is like most likely just due to the nature of like the um, biopharma sector it's most likely a small subset of bacteria that we can like replicate on mass right we can only grow so many strains of bacteria out there mm-hmm. and do it consistently so most likely what is available to us there is probably some overlap in these products yeah yeah i would imagine for sure yeah because um what dr tim's eco balance is also said to be anti-vibrio uh they've done tests on that and you know if this vivex stuff is anti-vibrio it just seems like it could potentially be 
the same product, just in a different form factor, mm-hmm. because the EcoBalance is a liquid. I think the VivX is a powder. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I wanted to talk about trace element delivery via bacteria, because I think that's kind of something that's potentially happening via this method, um, because you do add some trace elements to the concoction. So do you believe or have you read any literature to support that corals are getting these trace elements from like along with the bacteria that they're feeding on potentially? Um, so I haven't come across a specific article that has, you know, uh, had those exact claims and provided clean evidence mm-hmm. supporting them. But what I do think is that corals are more optimized at gathering their trace elements in a holistic nature through like prey capture, through maybe the sense of bacteria or the particulate food that we feed, mm-hmm. right? Kind of like, um, you know, certain with humans, um, certain supplements are easier metabolized and absorbed when taking in conjunction with another supplement, mm-hmm. right? That's why a lot of people still are deficient in certain things, even though they take the supplement, whereas a certain change in their diet would remediate it, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So I think that's the same thing uh, that could be happening here in the system where, you know, if we aren't feeding properly, the coral has another pathway to get all the things that it needs if it's available in the water column. But if it's not available in the water column, the coral is going to be like, hey, I got to eat or I got to get the right things in my body somehow. Mm-hmm. Right. And if it doesn't, you know, it could look ill, it could pass away or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, also a thought on that is because yeah, actually I should ask Jamie Craig's about this when I talk to him again, but how corals actually take in trace elements. But um, like you say, feeding, but also the zooxanthellae uh, are going to be they're going to not always be the same composition of what they're holding as well. So, you know, they could be right. iron iron or manganese, and therefore, mm-hmm. you know, that's more of that is getting delivered to the coral. But I don't know if, like, you know, is the polyp constantly just taking in, you know, the the, the tissue of the, of the coral and the polyp, is it constantly just kind of absorbing some of what's around in the body of water that's around it? You, you know, know, I, I wonder, th- right? Like, I, I want to say anecdotally, yes, because I feed my concoction like any time of the day, right? It's mm-hmm. whenever I'm home and I've gotten to the point where I feed every meal or every time I feed my fish tank, I'll, I'll mix everything together in, in one cup, like my fish food and this, um, and I'll feed the tank and the corals get the same reaction any time mm-hmm. of day that I do it, right? So I think there's a certain thing where one we have to train the coral first right Mm -hmm. to know that this is coming because in the wild these events are very sporadic right these large blooms of these rich nutrients just coming through you can't predict it right maybe you can predict it but it's like very seasonal or it's temporally dependent Mm -hmm. so the corals are all obviously always ready for it if they have these you know evolutionary mechanisms already baked into their biology Right. I'll send I think I'll send you a video, but these corals within about, you know, as early as in two minutes, but all relatively within 15 to 30 minutes, they'll release their mesenterial filaments into the water. Mm -hmm. And you can or I've I've seen it firsthand. There will be like a little bud kind of pop open from the skin or the cenosarc of the acropora. Right. And this little bundle will unravel. Right. This kind of like rope ladder kind of drops out. And that's the the filament that comes down. And then once the flow hits it, it starts like waving in the air. And then once like a particulate or anything kind of hits it, it starts retracting and starts clumping up. And then other things, other filaments will kind of like wave in. It starts retracting and pulling it back down. And then you'll see this kind of clump get pulled back to the skin of the coral. And then you'll see like a lump kind of form over, you know, that place where the filaments get Mm -hmm. erupted from. So I'm pretty sure, you know, The filaments are the coral's digestive system, right? So it's just wrapping these particulate foods and enzymes and digestive juices and just pulling it back into its body where it's readily assimilating everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the crazy thing about using this concoction is that I can repeat this 
all the time and at a magnitude that is pretty much you're like not reproducible with other individual products alone mm-hmm. right there's yeah. something about there's something about the the process that's happening in this jar that you just can't replicate by dosing like a individual particulate yeah. heat. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, dosing, you know, something like refroids or another coral food is it's it's not not doing anything at all. It's but it's yeah, it it's may be. Optimized. Yeah. And, yeah. and sort of I don't know how good and if we're talking about Acropora, I don't know how good Acropora are at actually absorbing these particulate foods directly. Right. You know, mm-hmm. I, then, I, I, in my experience, they don't actually stick to the polyps very well i've looked really closely i stick my face right up to the (laughs) you know turn all the flow off stick my face right off and you know you may see a little bit of a feeding response but it's not um and yeah like like i say they don't seem to stick to the polyps really well you saw the the pictures and stuff that i sent you though yeah and we'll we'll put them in the video they can be running yeah in the background it's like you you see maybe up to like two inch filaments extending from the acropora which is crazy right the actors look like fabius at this point Mm -hmm. which is pretty nuts like you you had no clue that this you know other side of this coral existed up until now Mm -hmm. and you know maybe before like you know i've noticed that the filaments come out before but usually they're very very small there's like one or two strands just kind of sticking in the water Mm -hmm. and i'm like oh wow i mean maybe that's the extent of what these things are but obviously from what i've been doing there's much more the coral can develop, especially if, you know, the coral is trained and knows that this is a uh, repeatable thing that's going to happen in its environment. Yeah, because and, and it's trained are, to feed during the day or whenever you feed versus, you know, corals are a little more conditioned to, um, you know, putting out their axial polyps and, and fully extending their polyps in the wild in the evenings because they're safer from predation. But what you're saying is you've kind of trained your corals to you know, expect this food anytime. Yeah. And, um, you know, anyone who has kind of kept like uh, non-photosynthetic corals, like kind of dendrophilia, mm-hmm. they'll probably know that if you feed it enough, it's always going to stay open, even if it's getting directly blasted with light mm-hmm. during midday. You know, usually these corals exist in the dark, right? And they only open when there's food in the water. But if you feed it all the time, it's always going to be open because... The coral's like, hey, um, I might as well get a free meal if, you know, the food's going to come in 30 minutes. I might as well stay ready. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, corals are definitely different in our tanks, um, which actually we could talk about this a little bit now. Um, is You said you had a trip to Vietnam recently and you had a, a bit of inspiration from, from the ocean and and maybe took some things to to think about and talk about. So, what, give me a give me a breakdown of some of your revelations. Yeah. So, um, you know, where my family comes from in Vietnam is that we're relatively close to the the shoreline. It's probably maybe like a ten minute bicycle ride on like a pretty janky old bike. So you're not going that fast. Mm-hmm. But um, from uh, where I live to the shoreline, I would go out there. Uh, I would do my morning runs at like 5 or 4 a.m. every day just because the lifestyle is so different over there. Mm. You wake up early, you have a mid-afternoon nap, and then you get back to work. And then there's a bunch of nightlife, and you go to sleep, Mm. rinse and repeat, right? Way different from America. But, you know, me waking up and getting to the shoreline, I would see all these fishermen hauls in like their daily catch, right? And a lot of the times that, you know, the fishermen can't sell everything all at once, they're obviously not going to let this fresh, like, great seafood decay, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people have developed methods of preservation of their foods and have found ways to make their food last longer. And I started thinking about, you know, how we could apply this in our reef tanks. And another big thing in Vietnam is that, um, you know, Vietnam grows a lot of shrimp. You know, uh, it's a, shrimp is a very, in demand pro, uh, product especially for global demand and a lot of these fisheries are kind of located in these like tropical areas where you know rich reef ecosystems exist in the first place mm-hmm. so there's a lot of you know similarities here and the water that is uh, pushed through these fisheries ultimately end up into the ocean somehow 
mm-hmm. and trying to see how these ecosystems are managed and how these fisheries are managed, I kind of started piecing together the lessons that I could learn and starting applying them into my own tank. And this is like, you know, this is where this kind of ends up is because once you start taking in those, you know, preservation techniques and these techniques to optimize the health of the things that you're growing, you can start seeing a bigger picture of what's really happening. And what's really happening is this continuous, you know, cycle that's always happening in nature, right? The uh, continuation of life and death, right? Pretty Mm -hmm. much. And if there's any, you know, kink in that cycle, one thing's going to start weighing um, more than the other, right? And if we start shifting things in our favor, let's say, that means we can either grow things more or we can kill things more. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, depending on what our situation is, we can specifically choose as humans what we want to optimize for. And pretty much I took those like food preservation techniques and applied it to the concoction where I can now keep this on the shelf in my pantry and it should be, you know, shelf stable for at least a year now versus, you know, me having to culture and worry about um, constant sterilization and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, what were some of the things specifically you took from sort of seeing how these fishermen were kind of preserving these foods and whatnot or, or repurposing them or, you know, what 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 directly was the inspiration of this? So. Um, in Southeast Asian cuisine, there's a lot of fermented fish products, right? Or fermented mm-hmm. like fish paste yeah. and, or shrimp paste or sh- squid, stuff like that. Yeah. And these processes basically require you to, um, freeze dry or dry out the food, which is in essence, what our reefroids or whatever is, mm-hmm. it's just dried marine matter. And then... You add a ton of salt into it, and then you just let nature take place, right? And what is nature, right? It's just a bunch of microbes slowly decomposing everything. And at the end of the day, after these processes, you get like a crazy ingredient that you use in making some of your favorite dishes, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking, okay, we fundamentally have all these things at home, right? We have uh, the ingredient. Our food, we have nature, which is our uh, microbes, and we have the enzymes and the trace elements, the salt, and all the stuff that is, you know, within the fish or the organism already from harvest, right? It's stomach, all the acids in there. And if we just theoretically let nature take place and then we put that stuff back into the tank, we should be replicating this concept of. Uh, marine snow right and what marine snow is in the ocean is this huge mass of decomposing living and dying material that feeds the world's oceans right and this is pretty much that in a super condensed form Mm -hmm. yeah and what i wonder too because i actually wanted to ask you this earlier because you were saying you make up you know fresh sterilized salt water to start the concoction but uh, couldn't you do like a hyper salinity to and essentially like as more of a preservative, but also uh, wouldn't that increase the metabolism of the concoction to have it at a higher right. salinity? So, you know, salting is a very popular preservation technique, right? And when you mix salt with bacteria, you could potentially inhibit the good microbes that you want growing mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. And another thing is if we go back and let's say make a hyper saline solution of the old concoction, you know, you're just going to have a large volume of salty water and a relatively low volume of raw ingredient. The ratio mm-hmm. is going to be kind of weird. Yeah. And at that point, you're going to be dosing the super salty water into your tank. Which you really don't want to do because it's going to screw up with everything. You know, it's going to screw the salinity. Uh, the other elements are going to move out of place and you don't want that. Obviously, you want to minimize those impacts as much as possible while maintaining like this buffering capability as well, right? Mm-hmm. You want to keep everything at whatever number you pick at, and you want to keep it stable. And what salting allows you to do in this is, 
not only that you you can limit the amount of liquid that is used, so that limits the change uh, osmotically when you f- feed it into the tank. Mm-hmm. You can also um, reduce even more potential pathogens by reducing the you know surface area or the volume of which the thing is grown in. Right, if you have more space, there's more potential for other things and other niches to be left unoccupied. So something could be super you know optimized for growing in that environment that you left completely wide open whereas this you pretty much squish down everything and compact it as much as you can and you know it's optimized to grow these probiotic bacteria and that's you know my theory at the point i'm looking to get you know this stuff um i'm going to get it tested to see what's actually in it mm-hmm. you know because at this point it seems for me, at least, the growth and especially the morphology of the acros, the way that they grow, mm-hmm. is so radically different from what has uh, been the norm beforehand. All the new growth that I get now from my acros is like incredibly dense. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not like these sporadic, like singular branches here and there. It's like a fist, right? Yeah. You know, it's a, like a, a stick. And then it gets super clumpy at the tip, and then you just get like five or ten. Just an explosion of up. axial tips growing out, mm-hmm. shooting out. Yeah, which is yeah. I feel like that's kind of, you know, you one thing growing a coral, but when you have a coral that just like it, it just absolutely wants to make new growth tips, then then you're in a in a good health position for sure. I kind of wanted to talk about troubleshooting problems with corals and, um, you know, kind of what your process is. And, uh, you know, I can weigh in quite a bit on this too. But I think um, just as a very general statement, um, would you agree that any problem with a coral or you could say in a reef tank in general is going to either be too much of something or not enough of something? But I think you can almost break down anything to the to the, those simple terms. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like a basic yes or no question, right? Is yeah. it happening or is it not happening? But yeah, yeah I, I definitely if you break it down like that. Of course, you know, a lot of times, um, what is the main factor is the amount of um, flow getting to your coral you know Mm -hmm. if the coral doesn't get enough flow it's not going to have um you know all the required trace elements it needs or you know the waste removal ability because all that stuff is just gonna stay stagnant around this like layer that the coral creates this kind of like stagnant layer of water and if it doesn't you know remove itself of that excess or there's not enough of cer- certain things in that realm, mm-hmm. obviously the coral is not going to do well. Yeah. Or, you know, lighting too much or too little or feeding too much or too little. Yeah. Yeah. So like Is some of the agree? first things you would look, okay, so let's say we have an acro mm-hmm. that's kind of, let's say it's, it's fading in color and the polyp extension's not very good. Like what would be the first things you would look at if somebody kind of came to you with that, that problem? Yeah, so this is kind of like building on like this concept of like creating like the sixth sense, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, just over time and just understanding the dynamics that happen in your tank, you can start boiling down certain things. In that specific situation where, let's say, like an acro um, is pale or looking not the best and there's little polyp extension, it could be a combination of a few factors. It could be uh, too much light. Uh, not enough nutrients, nutrients as in like proper nutrition, right? Not nitrates and phosphates because you can have any number of nitrates and phosphates from my experience. I run ultra high, ultra low. It's about the nutrition, not the value, right? Mm -hmm. You can look at the the same thing with like uh, food labels, right? This thing has 500 calories. This other thing has 500 calories, but one is, you know, broccoli. The other one's hot Cheetos, right? The nutrition is different. Mm -hmm. So... In that situation, it could be highlights, um, not enough food, or it could be potential pests if there's no polyp extension. Yeah. Most pests will um, irritate the polyps, make the, the polyp retract because the polyp is or the actual organism, right? Yeah. So if it's trying to protect itself and it's shielding itself from whatever is messing with it, and so, or it could be like a certain really crazy trace imbalance. 
Yeah. So I guess it could be those specific things because if you have a crazy high uh, value for trace, or let's say like iodine, you know, with iodine specifically, too little could be um, a very pale look in your corals, yeah. right? Kind yeah. of like this bleachy look, or too much will just be like this very black desert yeah. looking skin. It'll darken your corals, yeah. And then there's yeah. a relationship between iodine and some of the other halogens, um, like yeah. fluoride and bromide and and whatnot. But that's that's getting a little more complex. But yeah, so if you were to see, yeah, if somebody came to you with that, with that situation, um, you would probably ask them about, you know, their nutrition, like how the coral right. is being fed. And also, right. like, if you're going to check for pests, I mean, we're not going to go down the whole rabbit hole of talking about all the pests that exist. But, um, but I mean, obviously, like, oh, look really wait. closely at night. You know, you know something yeah. crazy? I, I, I was on a Yahoo uh, news article, and you know what they found? They found Acropora eating nudibranchs. Oh, great. Oh, we get to look this forward is like to a, that. <laughs> yeah, this is like a, a brand new, like, undiscovered species or something. And it was like eating some staghorn coral. And I'm like, wow, I hope I, I don't get Yeah, these. I mean, you got to assume it. it exists because um, nudibranchs are generally like a niche species-based type of um, eater. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. But, yeah. yeah, I would say, um, you know, check with a flashlight at night for acro mm -hmm. bugs really closely. And, yeah. you, you know, like... Bite marks. Yep. Yeah, bite marks or even just the actual little, whether they're the gray or the red or the black bugs, you're going to see them moving around more at night than you will during the day. But um, but then, you know, I also have noticed, um, you know, in my experience, if your phosphates are super low, you can start to see a decline in, in um, the richness of, of the, of you know, or the density of the zooxanthellae on, a, on, a, on an acro or any coral, really. But, um, right. you know, I would definitely yeah. ask you know, what their nitrate and phosphate is and what they are and look at the ratio that they are to each other as well. Right. The, I guess like a good way to look at it is that these test kits provide us a ratio of the excess, right? And given, you know, the proper biology is taking place, you know, all chemical reactions should have a, you know, stable output, right? Given X things going in, you should get Y things coming out, right? Mm -hmm. And so... By measuring or using our test kits and getting back this proper ratio, we can kind of say that, okay, the biology in our tank is working properly. I shouldn't be too worried, even though, you know, the number might be, the raw value might be something that might be worrisome in a specific case if we only look at the raw value. Mm -hmm. But looking at the ratio tells us, okay, all the things are happening properly. It's just at what rate mm -hmm. it's happening at, you know what I mean? If you have a very high, you know, amount of excess, it could just be saying that the rate that of which these reactions are taking place is too slow for the input that you're doing. Yeah. Or if it's too low, it could just be saying that you're in at an equilibrium, right? Yeah. Or if you're, um, or if you're constantly testing zero, and even though you do massive inputs, it's just you're not doing enough. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, like you say, with the ratio, um, where things start to have a little more problems, I think, is when you're running really low on the nitrates and high on the phosphates. Like if, you know, your phosphates were 0.2 and your nitrates were 1, I would yeah. probably say, you know, get the nitrates up, but ideally get the nitrates up from feeding. Uh, mm -hmm. However, I mean, I've been dosing ammonia um, for the, about a month now, and I've seen good results from that. You know, ammonia dosing is essentially, you know, it's fundamentally similar to the concoction that I'm making because, you know, all these raw ingredients turn into ammonia at one point through mm -hmm. the nitrogen cycle, right? So at one point in time, there is an excess of ammonia in the creation, but as the biology and the processes take place, that ammonia is converted into other things and eventually... Um, you you can see it in here. It bubbles out as nitrogen gas. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Yeah, because I wondered about, I was going to ask you about what happens if you add ammonia to that concoction in the early stages. Yeah, I mean, it might expedite things. It might not. But I mean, this is kind of similar to how people cycle their tanks with like a raw shrimp or something. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, except you're doing it in a super concentrated mason jar now. 
so back to this, um, you know, problem solving thing. Um, you know, you said, well, it could be too much light. Um, something that I tend to ask people if they have a problem with a coral is how long has that coral been in that exact same spot? And what has changed around it? Like, have you changed your yeah. lighting schedule? Or did you actually mm -hmm. literally grow that coral in that very spot with basically that same lighting schedule? Because it's already proven that it, it likes that light if you've grown a frag right. into a colony. So, you know, why would you say all of a sudden it's more sensitive to light? But there are some trace elements that, that, that make the coral more robust to high, right. high par lighting. And I think like zinc, iodine, zinc and yeah, yeah. yeah, and zinc and nickel I think play a part in that too. But um, yeah. you know that those like fluoride. So, yeah. so those would be some other things I would kind of consider. But I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Is is you know sometimes I'm like you know I'm going to move this coral because I think maybe it's not you know it's getting too much light or not enough. I'm like, but no, you know this has been here for two years and it's and it's great. The only things that that's going to be always changing is the flow. Because as yep. corals get bigger, they get more abstracted by all the corals around yep. them and everything that's blocking the space. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think like one of the first things you said was check the flow um, because that makes sense, right? Because, you know, if it's not pulling enough away from the coral, um, then those accumulation and problems are just going to kind of kind of sit and fester essentially. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. That's why, you know, that's why so many people shifted toward bare bottom systems right mm. it's because they wanted to maximize the amount of flow in there but you know you kind of lose some of the aesthetics and you kind of lose some of the fish keeping potential by removing the gravel and the sand bed yeah. but a lot of those systems do great because you know it's like the super turbulent reef you know there's no sediment there's no detritus building up and a lot of the nasty stuff is you know in that detritus that's why you know keeping certain corals on the sand bed is a big no-no Mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. and like how you said um you know going back to whether the coral is looking bad it depends on its history too right so if the coral started looking bad and it's been in a place where it's been you know most of its time in your possession that indicates a poor environment right mm -hmm. because something has changed from when you know it was doing really great in the same spot and now suddenly it's starting to die, that's obviously saying that the system around it is falling apart. Mm -hmm. But if it's, so let's say something that you just got or something that you just moved, it could be a bunch of other factors as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, I guess, to kind of, you know, the other thing I think is like the age of the system is a part of it too, because um, I've, there's got to be a better term than like beginner's luck, but I feel like some new hobbyists, um, they might have success for about the first, well, maybe not for the first few months, but let's say, let's say someone sort of ideally is a pretty successful hobbyist after a year and a half, but their tank is starting to fill up. And, and, you know, mm -hmm. one of the things that when they started that tank is it was all new water. There weren't a ton of corals competing for those trace elements and all of those things that are available. But then the real test happens when those colonies start getting larger, yeah, yeah. you know, and mm -hmm. that's kind of when things like this concoction kind of might start to make more sense for people because those nutrient needs, I mean, corals are grow exponentially, like not to be forgotten. Oh, that one, it's such 100%. a, you know, it's, it's the difference of, of a, of a tank that is just full of, let's say it even has 40, 50 frags in it. Let's say it's like a 120 gallon tank with 50 frags that are all, you know, an inch and a half or something, you know, that's nothing compared to like, someone who has giant colonies that are 16, 18 inches, you know, that colony alone yeah. could be the volume of all the corals in their whole tank. So it's, oh, yeah. it's so different, you know, you know, I guess, it, you know, kind of, kind of goofy, but you could kind of look at reef keeping as like keeping Clifford, the big red dog in your house, you know, that tiny <laughs> puppy grows into this humongous creature. But I mean, you're going to have to kind of take that same analogy and put it into your reef tank, right? You start as a tiny frag and as the months go by, it's growing at this exponential rate. And if we don't, you know, properly accommodate for it, right, let's say month one, you're feeding one gram of food a day. And by the end of year one, it's not going to be two grams of food per day. It's going to be something like 10 or 
30 or something like that, you yeah. know, if things grow at an exponential rate. It's not linear like a lot of other things that we're more like accustomed to, you know, like other pets that we keep and things like that. There things grow more at a linear rate, but yeah, with corals definitely. it's it's exponential, right? You get one frag and then suddenly you have a growth spurt, then you have four new branches, then they have a growth spurt, you got sixteen or you yeah. know, stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. It gets it gets crazy. Yeah, and then obviously another um, you know modern assessment tool we have at our disposal is is ICP and and you know I I would say um, there are certain metals that are contaminants that you know even if you don't want to go down the road of doing reef moonshiners or some kind of ICP based trace element system it's still good to do it you know, once or twice a year, just because you never know if there's like a like a magnet or something that might might be rusting out and, and leaching. And tin is is something that's a really bad heavy metal for 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 corals for sure. Yeah, that's a you know the issue of bioaccumulation is also like a big you know issue, especially in terms of the food that we eat. A lot of like these large like you know tuna and like seafood. Mm-hmm. have so much heavy metals that they've accumulated from being at the top of the food chain, right? And over time, that the same things happen in our tank, right, from the trace elements and the yeah. foods that we feed into our tank. And that's why systems like Triton really advocate for, you know, trace or, or macro algae growth. Because mm-hmm. what that macro algae does is that provides a way for you to extract all that bioaccumulated trace and unwanted heavy metals from your tank, right? The algae is a great... Um, substitute as like uh, this type of filtration media, and that's why like a lot of things like nori or seaweed that you feed the fish are so rich in these like um, elements because mm. that's what they've been sucking up from the water that they've been growing in. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and refugium and and nutrient export via you know chato or some kind of macroalgae is kind of gives you that buffer too. Like I don't personally run it on any of my systems. But, um, mm. yeah, I wonder, actually, kind of a question for you, but I've had problems with Alva algae on my frag racks, and it's really in the places that the, the tanks, tank, can't, the get tanks to. can't reach. Yeah. And I I, um, I added some emerald crabs and hermits, and actually they did a really good job at first. And I was like, wow, this is, like, like problem solved. And then I don't know if they just got more interested in other stuff, but they kind of stopped doing their job. <laughs> so... Um, do you think that potentially if I was to start running Chato or something on that system, it may potentially outcompete the Ulva? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, what's happening is what you want to do is you want to create like, this vacuum in the niche, right? If there's an empty vacuum in any niche, um, the science says that there is going to be something to occupy that niche and populate it, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. it's going to exploit it. So in your case, it's probably, in your case, it is Ulva, right? And if you potentially choose a, another organism that occupies in that same niche, there's going to be direct competition for yeah. the same resources there. So that's why, you know, growing macroalgae could be good. Or, but the thing is, you know, in order to do this successfully, you have to remove as much of the unwanted thing before yeah. you introduce the competitor, right? I agree. So you're going to have to get something to eat it all, and then you're going to have to something to replace it right away so that there isn't a bunch of excess yeah. and that could lead to something else growing in that place in the intermediary. Yeah, because my concern with just straight up adding macroalgae or a nutrient export via macroalgae is that um, at, at a certain point, they're going to start taking some of that nutrient that the corals are competing for too. And then you know, yeah. that could lead to problems. But I think you mm-hmm. make a good point. Um, you know, it'd be better to you know, acid clean my frag racks and, you know, remount a bunch of plugs and get as much of it out of the tank as I can. And yeah, then, and then do a preventative measure. Yeah, yeah, and then start growing some of that stuff. And then hopefully, you know, hopefully that works. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, you know. Yeah, I don't know what else to try, really. If you have a, a, a really good tang, I have a really hyper-powdered blue tang. Whenever mm-hmm. I put anything in front of his face, he comes in and cleans it up for me. Mm-hmm. So if you can train your fish, um, that's a great way to do it. Yeah. I've, like A lot of my fish are very friendly with my hand. Yeah. So whenever I put things into the tank and I'll just kind of show it to them and they'll all kind of like gather around the hand, clean it all up. And so that way, you know, I can clean things really nice. But, you know, the issue just kind of comes down to 
if the fish can get to it in the first place. Because mm-hmm. the tangs love uh, the sea lettuce or ova or whatever. Yeah, super it's, tasty. Um, it's basically yeah, seaweed. I mean, it grows on the it grows on the rim of my tank, right mm-hmm. where the the air hits the water, right right on the surface, right there, mm-hmm. like on the overflow grates or the weirs or whatever. Yeah, it grows right there. It's a great you know free food for your tank mm-hmm. at the end of the day if you feed it to your fish. But if you remove it, it's a good you know I guess uh, form of filtration as well. And all those uh, you know a highly uh, valuable nutrient uh, resource as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I actually haven't really looked into this, but um, flucanazole does mess with a lot of types of algae, but I don't know if that would be in the category that would be affected. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. I've never messed with the fluconazole personally. Yeah. I've thought about it on certain occasions, but um, usually I just stick to hoping that the concoction mm-hmm. battles it. Yeah. Because I've noticed that, um, you know, just doing this, a lot of the, the weird algae die off over time. Uh, cyano is slowly like, slowly backs away you know that like red turf algae in mm-hmm. my system has kind of backed off too surprisingly mm-hmm. interesting so it's not as vibrant anymore i wonder if and it's an lot- ammonia thing too because i since i started dosing ammonia i've noticed like other than the ulva i have like no kind of film algaes or anything like really on the surfaces my surfaces look awesome it just wherever there's ulva you know yeah i mean like the yeah, it's very sporadic, and then the algae that grows is mostly like macro algae mm-hmm. or like larger uh, algae forms. You yeah. know, it's not like the films or whatever, or like the the little stubby like yeah. hair algae. Yeah, that's all. That stuff is kind of knocked away. It's either like um, maybe like a long or large hair algae. Yeah, or like this like um, sea lettuce or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, fluconazole is um, pretty safe. Um, I I do understand that. Um, you know, algae being basically like a plant, it's, um, you know, that plants have, have actual toxins in them. So, you know, when we eat plants, like we're technically, are, we're processing a little bit of these toxins. I think if you hit a system that's super loaded with something like bryopsis, um, other than, you know, obviously you're going to change the nutrient profile of the tank by basically knocking out this, this source that's consuming your nutrients. Um, I think there's also some chemical, um, chemicals that are released when it dies off so i'd yeah. say for anybody treating with fluconazole definitely remove as freaking much as possible before you do it <laughs> and you know the cool thing about using bacteria in this use case is that um in the decomposition of you know these algaes like you said there are some unwanted substances and certain bacteria can kind of change the anti-nutritive properties of these you know compounds and turn these kind of waste things that we don't want into Mm -hmm. beneficial compounds that we could end up using as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of people, you know, which have said, you know, I had algae issues, I dosed this X bacteria, and then my algae went away and my coral looked better. That could be a possible explanation Mm -hmm. as to why. Because, yeah, that's not how the report always goes. You know, sometimes it's the algae went away and then, um, you know, my tank was kind of messed up for a year. Like, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, maybe I shouldn't leave this in, but I'll just tell you uh, that, you know, years ago when Vibrant came on the market, a lot of people were using it. And, oh, I uh, tried it too. You it know, screwed me over. Yeah, I mean, it, it actually worked great. I had bubble algae in a system that was a real problem. It was, it was uh, I never had that fine kind of... Um, Valonia that kind of goes everywhere like and it's just like it's like crusted all together yeah and uh it worked like a hot dam but like the bacterial composition of that system i i would say took like at least a year to get back to normal again yeah i think you know looking back at it um i used to have like two large sps grow out tanks and they were really like rocking. And then I, I used um, Vibrant or whatever. And it took a few months for me to notice, but I couldn't grow any acros in there afterwards. Mm-hmm. It, it took pretty much for it wiped out my entire systems. And I couldn't grow acros for at least a few years. And then eventually I just kind of gave up hope of ever, you know, reviving the system because whatever was in the tank already did its damage. And yeah. you just can't replicate like over 
you know, 10 years of microbiota. Overnight. Yeah. Like those probably like your biofilms are probably affected and, and, you know, all of the kind of, you know, essentially what's happening in the tank that is the equivalent of the concoction is just not really happening anymore. You know, that bioavailability of, of bacteria to the coral is just not, right. probably not there. So, yeah. yeah. The, the nutrient cycling is screwed up, you know. Mm -hmm. It's stuck at some certain stage and um, there's some cog in the cycle and it's just being held up. And, you know, like I said, that's going to influence the side weighing on life or death. In, in mm -hmm. this case, it was really heavy on the death side and <laughs> yeah. nothing could grow. Yeah, it's funny, though, because, you know, it's one of those products that um, it did what it said it would do actually quite well, but it didn't really talk about the repercussions after. It's like it's like a person taking an antibiotic and then, you know, having, um, you know, gut health problems afterwards or something like that, you know, colitis yeah. or, you know, something like that where you're, you know, you've messed up your your entire microbiome or at least in your digestive system. Yeah, what? What um, you know, you, you just can't replicate that stuff. And I, I mean, a lot of these, like um, I guess, uh, human autoimmune issues are just due to you know poor inoculation to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. So that's like um, a lot of people advocate for like a very sterile uh, upbringing versus like go play in the mud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a you can see, you can see the differences in the people. Yeah, or I played the in the way mud. That they grow that's up. for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> definitely on the play on the mud, stick your hand in the water side of things here. But, yeah, you know, um, obviously over time these things are, you know, actions that accumulate. They're not gonna see the instant repercussions and things, and that's how we should treat our tanks, right? Mm -hmm. Not on the time scale of one to two days. We're thinking at least months out in advance, or maybe even years, right? And that's mm -hmm. how ecosystems evolve, right? ecosystems don't evolve overnight right mm -hmm. you don't just have a lush tropical rainforest in a day you can't replant the amazon overnight it takes thousands of years for these large ecosystems to even start looking like the way that they look right right yeah. now yeah and that's kind of why i mean talking about the amazon and, and like those palm plantations there's such a monoculture that you know, apparently if you go into a palm plantation at night in the in the Amazon, these big multi acre um, plantations, um, you, it's like dead quiet at night. And, you know, one thing that they say about the rainforest is it is loud <laughs> as hell at night. You know, there's just nothing oh, yeah. but life and all of these things whizzing around and doing their nighttime thing, you know, but these mm -hmm. palm plantations. So, yeah, don't support foods that have palm oil, people the worst <laughs> no you know looking at how my tank has reacted from the concoction has really made me reflect on the things that i eat personally yeah right and just making like you know more conscious decisions on what i eat it's not like to say that i everything i eat is organic or vegan or whatever but it's just choosing let's say you know mass-produced food versus you know something with a little bit more nuance or mm -hmm. a special like source from like a specialty market or like a specific farmer that you know, right? Yeah. Or like supporting like these smaller businesses where things haven't become this one homogenous entity. Because, you know, even when I was traveling abroad, it was just, just one company masquerading as a bunch of smaller uh, companies selling you one product, mm -hmm. right? And in the terms of like coral nutrition, I guess it's kind of the same thing. I mean, people have become too hyper fixated on let's say like particulate feeds and they didn't really look at the whole issue of what coral nutrition is right it's the whole sustaining of that coral microbiome and not just oh, i'm just gonna throw food on this guy and hope it, it absorbs it yeah you know and and i think what you're getting to as well is the variety because you know um maybe Definitely it's, maybe it's not a thing that we need to just be like this is the coral food i feed and this this is the this food i feed and that's it i mean obviously i mean certain regions of the ocean are gonna be a little more specific to what kinds of things feed the corals right you know and in the you end of the day to... things are just you know a protein composition of a protein and you know carbohydrate and whatever else is in there but mm -hmm. um i think it does matter to vary it just in the same way that we do yeah you know kind of going back 
or looking back at briefing history, there was this like crazy trend back in like the or early or mid two thousands about Papone. Have you ever heard about it? What was or it called? Papone. No, I don't think. Or, it, yeah. <laughs> it was like this uh, Italian method where they used a bunch of raw seafood sugars, um, like uh, vinegar or whatever, or some type of carbon source, and then they loaded it with um, human growth hormone. Oh. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> supposedly it led to you know crazy results in the coral, just like growing like like weeds, like you know mm. SPS filling up a tank within a year. Granted, you know, a lot of those species in those, you know, photographs were like very fast growing stags. Yeah. So that could have just been a, you know, a natural uh, product of, you know, a fast growing coral species. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's still very impressive given the technology and the husbandry techniques back then. So there could be something, you know, just like the final composition or, you know, some form of bioactive compound triggering mm -hmm. the growth response in corals. Where, you know, I think it's just like using a, you know, holistic method kind of like this and tackling it at like a microbial level offers you. Because in here, there's at least, you know, a dozen or something different, like raw, like food, marine, like ingredients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it provides like this whole shotgun approach in terms of nutrition, right? Yeah. So yeah. you might, you might not be optimizing, let's say like a, specific color but at the end of the day you're going to get you know reproducing and like reproducing corals right you're going to have the productivity uh, showing off and increased growth yeah yeah for and then sure. you can like fine tune things with like a you know upping some trace element or you know whatever the light yeah. Yeah, and um, something I want to get into the next time I have Jamie Craggs on is I, we actually didn't get into any part of his feeding protocol, but he's been quite interested in in your concoction. Um, so we were all going to have a discussion about some stuff soon. So we'll that'll be an interesting. It's a secret right now, but uh, I'm excited for that conversation for sure. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, I mean, he can use this or at least the premise to you know some good works. I, I mean, my goal is. Um, actually to induce a spawning event soon. Yeah. Especially if this is like, you know, going to solve the nutritive needs of the corals. Everything that I need to set up at that point is like the, the blackout chamber and uh, the proper scheduling. And then I already have, you know, a properly like seated tank ready to go. It's just yeah. an empty frag flat. So I just have a nice. bunch of tiles ready to go in there. Um, getting it seeded with like making sure that coralline algae grows, then I'm going to try and source some urchins or whatever. Yeah. And you know, if that works out, you know, that would be awesome because I've had some of these, um, these trachophilias that I've had probably for about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And I would love, you know, for them to spawn because they've at least, you know, five, 10 X in terms of, like, they probably have spawned. Mass. I mean, you can, you can assume you they know, have. Yeah. My, my acanthos have spawned. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't witnessed the, the trackies spawning yeah. with my eyes, but, you know, if one species has spawned randomly, I, I wouldn't doubt it if something just happened without me noticing. Yeah. Yeah. And like, unfortunately, with those non-colonial corals, um, you know, going back to my conversation with Jamie, one of the problems is you, you can't really check the cross section of the skeleton for the, um, yeah. you know, gam yeah. yeah, without uh, essentially damaging or killing the coral so it makes sense with acropora but yeah no it's been great i've seen a lot of uh, people are kind of excited to potentially give some of this stuff a, a try i have a a friend uh who i'm bringing in uh eight sort of medium to large millipora colonies from australia so they're gonna they'll be you know different color morphs and he's gonna try spawning them because knowing that they're all from the same region same collected region they're all probably pretty close to maturity the size where they can reproduce um seems to be a good good potential way to go for it oh sweet yeah, yeah i mean it's just um at that point it's just getting the coral like uh, acclimatized yeah to the system and then giving it the resources that it needs to produce its offspring. Yeah, that's because that's the thing is it's like you kind of have to be knocking it out of the park in terms of nutrients for the coral to have the resources to produce, you know, these egg and sperm bundles. Right. And, um, you know, going back to bacteria, 
you know, when uh, certain foods or like certain some of these like probiotic um, frozen foods came out, like uh, LRS, you know, mm-hmm. containing like these probiotic bacteria, a lot of people had noticed much improved like spawning rates in their fish, right? Their clowns or their angels or whatever were spawning at a much higher rate. Mm. And that's probably due to whatever, I think it's like some lactobacillus strain Hmm. in the food that is making, you know, the digestion and release of these nutrients much more easier on the fish. So it's, Mm -hmm. they get more for less, right? And in large commercial aquaculture, they base a lot of things on um, a concept or a metric called the feed conversion rate, Mm -hmm. right? So it's how much, yeah, so it's like how much, uh, how many kilograms of feed to get one kilogram of your product, right? Mm -hmm. And through using probiotic bacteria, people can lower that rate. So Mm -hmm. it seems that, you know, there is some like method or mechanism of efficiency taking place here. Yeah, yeah. And that will be a good question for Jamie actually was on my list um, for this next conversation was how much of the composition of you know, nutrients and food that a coral takes in, how much of it is bacteria versus like actual particulate uh, versus the zooxanthellae, you know, the sugar, you know, zooxanthellae, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah, that's a tough question. I mean, I think it's, um, the overall picture that influences it because what I think is, uh, potentially that the coral might not directly eat these bacteria because, Mm -hmm. you know, as some have pointed out, these are, you know, land-based strains. So perhaps the the corals don't care and they just eat any form of bacteria. Mm -hmm. But what these probiotic bacteria have in common is that they enhance the nutrient extraction and efficiency. So it could be that, you know, in association with these bacteria, the coral can utilize more of what they capture. Mm. Or perhaps, you know, the decomposition of the food alongside the bacteria releases this signal to the coral which makes it more responsive to feeding in the first place right Mm, and yeah you know when you just feed one product on its own you might see a slight reaction but in the case of sps it's usually never any reaction right unless it's like a a product kind of like a uh, oyster feast but even then um it kind of you know it's nothing compared to what I get from the re, uh, the concoction and yeah. the amount of, you know, amount that I put in and the, re, the results that I get out. It's, like I said, roughly one gram of the concoction at this uh, iteration per 100 gallons. Mm-hmm. And that's literally nothing. Yeah, that's not very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I guess another thing I was just thinking now was um, the, the zooxanthellae as a food source being probably primarily a carbohydrate because it's the sugars essentially from the the algae that yeah, it's taking, it's, taking in. Yeah, the byproducts of the photosynthesis yeah. pretty much. So it would kind of make sense that the coral would need um, a high the, protein food as mm-hmm. along with the, the sugar. high sugar. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, which is something Claude uh, brought up in my podcast with him was that these the foods that we feed the corals should really be, I think, something like 75% um, protein or more. Um, and yeah. if you look at the analysis of different foods, we were talking about this, I'm not going to say brands or anything, but you'll see some pretty large variability from one to the, to the next. Right. There's, um, there's a wide array if you look at the spec sheet of the feeds that we use. Mm-hmm. But I think it's also, you know, specific things don't, uh, I guess, accommodate for the needs of the specific individual or the system in general. Right. Certain, you know, especially in people, let's say someone that's uh, looking to bulk or gain weight or put on a lot of muscle. You'll obviously those people will know what a very high protein diet is going to do to their body, right? Mm-hmm. Ends up with a lot of bloat, uh, indigestion. The gas is pretty gnarly, and so perhaps there could be some similarities that happen in the coral as well, where you know an overly high protein diet could you know result in some maladies as well, or a high carbohydrate diet could also lead to other things, right? Mm-hmm. With people as well, like, you know, obesity is pretty common with high carbohydrate diets or high carbohydrate, low protein. 
And perhaps there could be some, you know, similar issue in corals. And it's always about finding this like proper ratio of intake, right? Yeah. And, you know, finding that optimal optimal point for everything. And how do you find it for so many things that we choose to keep? It's pretty hard. And so, you know, in, I guess my entire reefing philosophy has always been this like shotgun approach because I try and grow as many things as possible that need so many different micro and macro needs that if I were to sit there and hyper fixate over one specific thing, it's just human nature for me to overlook another element that I'm yeah. forgetting. Yeah, totally. That's a good, good thing to keep in mind. Well, um, I feel like let's, let, we can close this off on, uh, the reefing sixth sense that we talked about. So, um, yeah, I mean, I kind of, it's funny cause you mentioned having a reefing sixth sense and, you know, having an eye or an intuition, you know, my thought immediately goes to kind of, um, you know, developing your ability to see little things going sideways in the tank, or, you know, you just know how things look better one day versus the the last day. Um, you know, that's mm -hmm. the way I see it, but you were kind of talking about it in a different way. So maybe you can, you can explain. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the sixth sense is a very large and overarching topic that reefers has kind of developed innately over time right for me it's like noticing when you know let's say like a certain health of a coral is deteriorating or things are looking really good but it could also be in the sense of your equipment or just certain things around your house right so certain days i'll go into my fish room and i'll notice like the tur turbidity of the system is kind of off right or the water is a little cloudy or a little yellow or whatever. Mm -hmm. That kind of indicates certain things to me that maybe perhaps my filtration is off or overfeeding or, you know, just something is causing this fouling to happen in the system. And a lot of times, you know, inexperienced people are just probably just going to brush that by. And if you don't kind of nip it at the bud or notice it early enough, that's just going to compound over time. And especially in the case of like equipment, if you hear like a random noise, or something that you shouldn't be hearing like your hump just your or, or if you're like your pump just made like a random click you're like oh is that a magnet or what's happening mm -hmm. you know some people might just brush that and you know just kind of forget until it's a big issue and you have like a huge rusty magnet killing everything in your tank but you know it's just these small little things like these little twitches that you get in your body or your these gut feelings that tell you to investigate what's going on and if once you start kind of looking at those clues and like looking at your tank and hearing and listening to what your tank is telling you, you you know, reef keeping becomes very easy. I mean, for me at this point, I my routine is, you know, I could boil it down to four things. I do a weekly water change or like skimmer, you know, checkup. Mm -hmm. And then I feed my fish daily or and the concoction. And then I'll dose some trace elements and that's it mm -hmm. yeah and then I'll so that's just an easy make day sure that, that's your most minimal yeah. day yeah <laughs> yeah and then in all the steps in between it's just me checking on my calcium reactor or the status of all my equipment right it's giving everything a good look seeing if the co2 is still going into the reactor if my drip's still going if my mm -hmm. pumps are still pumping the water or if anything's clogged or if there's like weird sediment building up or films are accumulating that they shouldn't be, you know, you just start noticing these things or the things that you catch out of the corner of your eye mm -hmm. most of the time. Those are the most important things that we kind of overlook, you know, yeah. things that we just kind of brush by and then they accumulate to the point where they're noticeable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I mean, little things I notice too is that, you know, there's some days where your corals just seem to have like better fluorescence or the way the polyps are extending are just a little more like waving in the flow versus just like maybe slightly more held in. Yeah. You know, there's those little mm -hmm. things that, you know, kind of make you go, okay, like don't get too complacent. Um, you know, even though you, you have a trident on this system or an auto tester, like test, test all the things. And, you know, you might yeah. find something was a little weird and, you know, hopefully that helps you solve tr troubleshoot. But um yeah, it's like just getting an eye for those little things to me is like the the sixth sense. And, and um, I mean, maybe it's just maybe that's just our senses in general, just but it's there's something about the, the reefing sixth sense that's like you just feel like something sometimes something's not quite right. 
you know? yeah you know they're all just like these subconscious signals that your tank is telling you right you could walk into your room and your fish room could smell a little different or your tank mm-hmm. water could feel a little different some people you know say like you know are hypersensitive and can say like oh my tank water is more sticky or you know more fluid today and that mm-hmm. could indicate certain changes in the biology of the tank and you know if you just don't catch some of these things or you just don't have enough experience you're just obviously just gonna wait until you know the results are noticeable but it's you know the six senses something that you build on with experience you just can't automatically put out a thousand bucks and get it and, or yeah. develop it and you can't just get it through watching a bunch of youtube videos and people trying to explain it to you too Mm -hmm. you have to be hands-on and be there you know it's kind of like when you're a kid and your your dad tells you to hold the flashlight you know you have to kind of be there firsthand and observe and notice these changes take place and then once you know the entire process right then you can take that knowledge and be like hey i'm right here in this process Mm -hmm. if i don't do anything i'm gonna be over here and i don't want to be over here Mm -hmm. right yeah that's a great, great way to put it for sure yeah. Yeah. So you have to see the entire thing play out, and then you have to start remembering it through repetition, or you start taking notes, and then you notice these trends, and you're like, "All right, where am I in this big picture of things, and where do I want to be?" And right. And then you start making this game plan of putting yourself in work, this boat. So you know, yeah. it kind of boils down to thinking through everything clearly and just very, you know. Uh, clean observation of your tank because mm-hmm. a lot of the we enjoy our tank through our eyes pretty much right and everything that we do is we observe it through our eyes and our hands and if we don't use these tools that you know we've been given and we just kind of throw out all of our intuition out of the window what's the point like you're not learning and you're not uh mm-hmm. building any more depth to your reefing knowledge right and if yeah. you're just going to go through uh what the literature has says it's the literature is not a one-to-one to your exact system right so if some book or some article says to keep it at this value or to put in this much input you also have to look at the conditions of that study right how what methodologies were taking place what was the density yeah. um were these like you know captive grown corals or whatever how are you going to match that exact uh, situation and replicate it so you have to take these tidbits of you know information that you pick up here and there and then you kind of have to make your own like little play-doh mold of things i think it's kind of like you almost want to have like a troubleshooting manual (laughs) for your for your own tank and having that intuition you kind of know what some of those things might be right away but but um if you're newer you know like go through the process of thinking like okay, could it be any of these trace elements? Could it be a nutrient imbalance? Could it be, you know, and, and kind of have that vocabulary of things you can you can look at, you know, or draw from when you're trying to assess, you know, whether something's going good, bad or good, because it might be going better all of a sudden and you want to know why it's doing better, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's another key thing to do is to not over like, hyperfixate. Yeah. Because it's just, it's human nature just to look at, or hear someone mention something in passing, and then that just kind of sits in your brain, and mm-hmm. then you just kind of look at this one thing where, you know, potentially that's not even your your issue to begin with, right? And taking a step back is always a great step, and, you know, coming back to your issues with a clean, fresh mind. Because once you, you know, take a look at the bigger picture, it could just be very obvious. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the solutions to, like, tank imbalances is, like the easiest way or, you know, it's been like this throughout the reefing hobby is just do a water change. Right? Yeah. Just do continual water changes in that if you have a good starting salt mix, that should fix your situation over time. But right? I was going to say, it's, too, I've caught myself before being like, OK, I think the solution I, you know, it's it maybe is a little bit of a band aid, but I'm just going to do like a, you know. 20 percent water change like a fair like a decent sized water change and then i've caught myself in being like you know what no i should actually just let the tank chill and let the biology of the tank run its oh, course yeah. because I, I you mean, know it's not always the solution you know yeah i mean it could just be like a an off day right it's kind of like looking mm-hmm. at you know time series like a great 
example is like looking at the stock market, right? Given, you know, the world's a great place, you know, there are good days and bad days, right? Even though, you know, the world is stable and everything's, everyone's happy, mm-hmm. you know, the stock market could take a dip and your tank could take a dip for some reason too, you know, just yeah. be a, a bad day, right? Like the weather pressure was kind of weird or, you know, there was like, something invisible that happened or you know seasons changing or yeah you know something that you can't so control. many out, like little outside factors yeah yeah and if you know it's not like a widespread issue where you know a specific thing is dying out of control or something is just going rampant in your system best course is if it's not like a drastic issue just let it coast right it's going to mm. fix or it's going to work itself out given that you you know, keep your husbandry the same and that you are pretty astute on everything. Yeah. Maintenance but especially. If, yeah. Yeah. But if you're, if you're not doing that in the first place, you better start doing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great note to leave on, um, you know, because yeah, just remind people to be diligent and also like enjoy the hobby, but, but, but just remember like, you know, just, just maintain your stuff well and and learn to look to know what what to look for in your tank you know i think that's a good takeaway yeah you know this hobby is you know it's so wonderful because there are so many different facets you could take it down you could be like super hyper fixate on one thing or you could just be the type of guy that takes like 10 steps back it's like it's like wow i got a fish tank in my house now and that's already awesome yeah in its own right yeah but it's like you know this hobby can bring you so much joy in so many different areas and it just all depends on what you want at the end of the day, right? What I want and what you want aren't going to be the same, but there are things that we can, you know, learn from both of each other's life lessons. And if it makes our end goal any easier to achieve, you know, you might as well do it. Yeah. Um, And, you know, just going back to it, if we can find certain ways to make the things that we do much more enjoyable overall, it's just going to bring more joy into your life. Right. And if it makes the hobby, you know, less time consuming and more productive in any way, it's just a no brainer for me. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And hopefully the concoction uh, may, may be part of that, making things easier, even though it may seem complex to some people initially, but (laughs) yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, in the future, I definitely want to at least simplify this and get it down to an even more like fundamental composition mm-hmm. where, you know, it's more this, you know, feeding methodology is more accessible to a lot of people. Because like, you know, if you buy all the ingredients or everything that I use specifically, it's going to cost a lot of money. Yeah. And if you, you know, decide to use your own, you know, combination of the core components, you know, you might get different results and all that, but if we can kind of standardize this and say, you know, this is the end all be all, that'd be great. Because from what I've noticed, it's kind of like, you know, by doing this, it's been that end all be all for me, like this miracle snake oil, Mm -hmm. in my opinion, Mm -hmm. like it's literally a one product that covers all my needs. Yeah. I've sent out a, I'm going to be sending out a, another ICP, when after two weeks of like, using this consistently okay so are you gonna put like a uh, certain amount of it like uh you know 0.1 mil or something in in some salt water or what's your plan oh for for this thing getting ICP'd? to get icp'd yeah you wouldn't icp that directly would you yeah i'm not gonna icp the mud no <laughs> but i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna dilute it some way so that i can at least figure out the math once i do yeah. the calculation yeah but in terms of like I kind of want to see what it's done to my tank, you know, in terms mm-hmm. of trace and elemental consumption, because from what I can see with my eyes, there's been a lot of skeletal growth. And, you know, I've been keeping alkalinity and calcium stable from calc and my calcium reactor, but I have no clue where my traces are. You know, mm-hmm. I just dose, you know, a few KZ products in the Tropic Marin trace just to kind of shotgun everything. Yeah. Cause I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, it'd be really interesting to see if those numbers stay stable because it could indicate that, you know, the corals are getting everything they need from the feed and not versus so much from the uh, water column. Yeah. So yeah. it could kind of be like another like eye opener in how we keep our corals where we could be like, hey, 
just feed your water correct or feed your tank correctly really don't have to worry about all the trace and stuff. It would be kind of nice to stop thinking about trace so much, but um, yeah, seems to be working for some people. So, you know, but like you say, it could just be a different approach to um, essentially corals getting, getting what they need. Yeah. And I mean, if you can obviously combine everything, get the pros and cons of everything to max mm -hmm. and minimum, maximum in your situation. Right. Cause if, you know, if this feeding, if the concoction has, you know, some, uh, drawbacks in this place maybe moonshine or another method is going to alleviate your drawbacks right but yeah. using one thing on its own you're always going to have some you know qualms with it so you always have to find an another solution to kind of uh remediate that yeah totally so it's all <laughs> there's never going to be a you know end-all be-all product but there will be things that are going to get you very close to it that's yeah. what my opinion is yeah for sure Lots of things that help. All right, man. Well, uh, thanks for doing this again. It's always good to yeah, see what you're up to and thinking about and, and progressing on. So um, have you back again some maybe six months or a year or something. Yeah, hopefully by then, you know, this thing will be like very flushed out mm -hmm. and, you know, I can be a bit more open and more people can try it out at this point. Because from, you know, a small sample size of, SPS keepers that have been doing it, it's, you know, we're at the point where, you know, we've seen repeatable, you know, benefit. Yeah. Especially in prolonged use. So, you know, it's going to be us tracking if there is any long term repercussion to this method. Yeah. And, and then I think it's just, you know, refining the ingredients that go into it yeah. and choosing the best things to, you know, put into our reef cleanest sources the things that provide like the most nutritional benefit and totally. you know i got something really you know cool in the works coming up soon so if uh that works out that'll be really amazing and then we'll be one step closer at, yeah you know simplified maybe marketable we'll see we'll see what your plan is <laughs> <laughs> we'll see we'll see yeah. but you know if it if it gets to help a lot of people i'm totally down for it and at yeah. the end of the day you know if this can help you know, coral restoration in any way, which, you know, if it does lead to a more sustainable and, you know, consistent breeding method, um, you know, I'm all for it, man. Yeah. That would be amazing. Totally. Yeah. It's awesome. All right, man. Cool. Well, thanks. Let's, we're always chatting. So I'll talk to you soon for sure. <laughs> all right. Okay. Catch you later. Have Adam. a good night, man. Okay. Cheers. You too. Thanks for listening to another episode of Beyond the Reef. I feel like Alan is getting so well known for this concoction that if there was an action figure of him, his accessory would be a jar of brown goo. If you want to get into a little more detail on Alan's reasoning and methods, he made a great video, which I will link to in the show notes. That is Critical Reef Theory Episode 1, and I'm sure there'll be an Episode 2 pretty soon. And as per usual, if you have any suggestions for future guests, uh, want to just ask us a question, make a suggestion, make a criticism, whatever you want to say, uh, feel free to reach out at beyondthereefpod at gmail.com. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a review. And if you're looking for high quality aquacultured corals in Canada, please check us out at fraggarage.ca. Hope to hear from you soon.